All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Vic Winquist. It's August 11th, 2021. We're outside the library and outside the theater at, at Linfield University. Vic, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate this. It's a pleasure for me. Thank you. So let's start with the most obvious question, which is why wine, or in your case, why grapes? Uh, actually, it was pretty simple. I, w I grew up in Puget Sound on uh, Bainbridge Island, as I like to say, before it was Bainbridge Island. It was uh, before the influence of uh, the, the money from Seattle. It, w it was uh, a time of dirt roads, and there was still an indigenous reservation on the island and uh, and we had some farming in the middle of the island and interestingly enough the Filipinos were there and so we had the Indians the Filipinos and us kids who all blended together and it was quite a culture but I felt it the island itself was very confining and my, my parents, uh, they were first generation. And my mother's side was from Denmark and my father's side uh, was from Sweden. And, and their parents would come over to the island from Seattle on the weekends and they would bring things and talk about Europe and and my grandfather on my mother's side would bring a bottle of wine every weekend for our festivities. And to this day, I can remember the American one he'd always bring was Christian Brothers, their Cabernet Sauvignon from the old Greystone winery. And he'd say, this is a good wine. <laughs> and, and then he'd bring some French wine uh, that was usually what he did, and and then uh, uh, also um, that that pardon me that started me thinking about the world, and they carried the on the European tradition of the the children could have a little bit of wine, not a lot, just a little bit, and then we'd talk about it. And I can't remember when I didn't drink wine. And so uh, that started opening up my mind to the world of wine. But there was a counter one too in that my, my, my parents who were not wealthy at all. Uh, my mother was a retired ball professional ballerina. <laughs> my father an artist. And uh, they, they were struggling a, a bit, but one time in a local lottery, they won the lottery and the uh, award was a big shotgun. Of course, my, <laughs> my family didn't know what to do with it. And so they sold it, but they said, well, let's live it up and they bought a TV set. This was 1952. And I got hooked on Shell's wonderful world of golf. So I got some used clubs and got a book and started to learn how to play golf because I thought that might be my ticket off the island. So it was one out of two, the wine industry or golf. And I did pretty well at golf. But we, of course, weren't in any country club or anything, so that got stifled a tad. But my grandfather, when I was 15, for my birthday, gave me a book on the great world of wine. And, you know, normally a kid 15 wouldn't want something like that, but I was different. I, I was just an avarice reader and kind of a loner. And so I think that first night I did not sleep. I was reading that book about all these places. And of course in that time, the big emphasis was on wine from France, 
and from Germany and Italy and some from Spain. Very little about California. But it had diagrams of wineries and it showed all the grape varieties and so I really got into it at a young age. And uh, I went away to college, but when I finished uh, my undergraduate, somebody made a mistake and on my exams to get into graduate school, I actually got into the University of California Law School. <laughs> somebody made a mistake there, but, but uh, I went to live in San Francisco, and then I'd commute to the law school. That at Berkeley? I did both. I did Hastings at the uh, San Francisco, and then some courses at Bolt Hall. And, but I needed to make money. And of course, what did I do? I went up to the Napa Valley, and, and my brother was visiting. I remember when I I went up there, and pardon me for this long answer, but no, nope, uh, no apology needed. Um, my true introduction to the wine industry was after I'd read a lot of the history about Knapp and Sonoma and all that. Well, my brother and I went up to Napa, and we went to Rutherford one of our many stops, and this was on Highway 29 before there were really any people there, you know. It was just very quiet. But I decided to start at the bottom at Buena Vista and work my way up, and we got to Beaulieu Vineyards in Rutherford. And I got out of the car with my brother and we started walking to the tasting room. And this is when I really got into the wine industry. I saw this little guy, this older gentleman, he kind of veered off, he was right by us and he was going to the tasting room. And he went out in the vineyard and he grabbed some clusters of grapes right off the vines, just ripped them right off and started eating them. And I couldn't take it. I went up to him and I said, you know, they probably won't like that, you out here. <laughs> I said, this is a historic vineyard. This was planted in 1901. This is the George Latour Vineyard. And it's so historic. And he had this kind of strange accent. And he, he, he told me, you know, I, he said, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I think, yeah, you're right. I'll tell you what, I'll buy you uh, some wine in here. Let's go in here. My brother had taken off. He was so nervous about it. But and So we went in, I'll never forget it, into the tasting room. And it was pretty noisy. There were quite a few people. And I opened the door and let him in. And suddenly the place went quiet. It's like the Pope arrived or something. And he went up to the tasting bar and the, the young woman attending everybody stopped and she said, Mr. Chelischeff, oh my God. how are you today? And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> What have I done? And he turned around and we talked and he said, I'd like to introduce Mr. Winquist. His name's Victor Winquist. And any wine he wants to taste, we're going to taste it. And we sat down. Finally, my brother came back and realized I was going to live. <laughs> and we spent over an hour and a half going over wines. And Andre told me later, he said, anybody with that kind of passion, I appreciate so much. And from then on, that was 1970, 
un until he died uh, in, let's see, I'm not sure of the exact year, but he was 93 when he died. We were friends and I worked, I get, he gave me a job as a seller rat to start out and and he introduced me to other winemakers in the valley. I got to know uh, Robert Mondavi, uh, August Sebastiani, and they kind of moved me around among themselves because they thought I had potential, and thank God. Uh, and uh, so consequently, that's how it evolved. And, and my professors back at my original undergraduate university were somewhat shocked when I dropped out of law school. But the passion was there for the wine industry. And it never went away. And um, that's how it all kind of manifests itself. That's an incredible introduction to the wine industry. Yeah, you can't do much better than that. And that's why, you know, I feel luck has been behind me so much in my career. And, and those were, you know, from the days where tourism really wasn't that much in the Napa and Sonoma area. Mm -hmm. And so you, you really had to have an interest to go up there because they, they didn't have the train and all those things. And kind of these dusty roads and you'd find these places. Mm -hmm. And like Buena Vista didn't even have concrete floors. It was still muddy in the, all their caves and everything, you know. So it's a different world and I'm one of my great, my happiness comes from seeing that transition, going through it myself, mm -hmm. experiencing all that. So, so with that as your introduction, what, what, what did you as, you, as you dropped out of school and, and decided to follow wine, what, what did you think your path was going to be? What did you envision yourself doing per, as a career? At that point, I was dedicated to having that path open up the world to me. I, I wanted not only to know how to make wine in California, but to really see experience European wines too, and go to South Africa, go all over the place and, and see it. That was my ticket to see the world. That was one side of it. But the other side was, it, it manifests itself in wanting to be a pioneer in a new area too. Mm -hmm. And of course that, that happened. I've got to let you ask some questions, so I got, you know, I you keep going on this. But. You can tell the whole story without me talking, that's totally fine. Well, so tell me the first step then. You, you, you drop out of school, what's, what's your first job in the industry? What, what's the first thing you're doing? I'm working for Andre Chelischeff as a seller rat. And he quickly went from doing that to getting me involved in the cooperage and actually putting it together at times and, and conditioning the casks and and then uh, he he let me participate in the vintage he was showing me what to do and mm -hmm. and then um, for some reason he thought it would be good if I went to the new winery in the valley and that was Robert Mondavi's and really participate in in some of the his techniques, which were kind of new techniques mm -hmm. using cooperage mm -hmm. in the valley. And then uh, I went over to Sebastiani's some to actually work in the vineyards mm -hmm. too. There, uh, in those days, there was a lot of communication 
among the wine families mm -hmm. and the winemakers. And I wasn't the only young person that they were kind of chaperoning around, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not that special. There were a lot of people doing that. And, but I liked it all. And then, uh, then an event happened that really crystallized my direction more, and that was um, Andrei Chelyshev decided to make some Pinot Noir. You don't hear about this or read about it in the books, and there's a good reason for it, because he got so frustrated with it. <laughs> He, he sold off the wine in bulk. And, and the reason was the, the grapes were coming from up by Ukiah, which is pretty warm up there. Italian family, for some reason, put, put it in. And so when we got the grapes, they looked, they looked good, but you could taste them and they, the acid had dropped out of them. But we tried to make good wine out of it. And Andre, it's interesting, a lot of the winemakers, I, I concluded that every good winemaker has a terrible temper because um, there was no secret Robert Mondavi was like that. He, he sought perfection and, and it was frustrating at times. And Andre, being the Russian that he is, or was, he lived up to that classic reputation. He had quite the temper, too. So we were making Pinot Noir, and he was tasting it. And he turned to me and said, you can finish this. I'm not going to swear on my interview, but he had a few choice words. And so he left it with me. And that was my real introduction to making wine. It was the Pinot Noir. And I talked to people in the industry, and they were doing things like putting citric acid in it to balance it back and all that. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. And it didn't turn out very well. So after that, he was saying, you know, you're young you should go find a place you can really grow Pinot Noir well. Try to match the climate of Burgundy. And so that, you know, there it was, the, the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert Mondavi was trying to do the same thing. And the difference was he, Robert Mondavi took on the task himself. And this is one of those chapters that have been left out of the book too, you know, in Robert Mondavi's life. He, he bought a tremendous amount of acreage in Chile. And the thought was to grow cooler climate grapes. And one of the featured ones was uh, Pinot Noir. Well, it turned out that the property he bought was not suitable for vineyards, and, and that really frustrated him because he'd thought at one point of coming to Oregon, too, but with the problem in Chile, he, he decided it wasn't, he wasn't going to expand to other states or other countries anymore at that point. And so, I was left with the idea of coming to some area that matched up very well with Burgundy. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time doing research, climate research, soil research, and I was, I, I had an incredible opportunity because there was no bias. I didn't have to look where the vineyards were already planted. 
I looked for places where they should be planted. And so I had so much research that I compiled. And I showed it to Andre Chelischev. And he really didn't even guide me on that. He left it to me to do that. And so I looked in the Monterey area. It looked pretty good. But then I looked in the Willamette Valley. And the more research I did, the more I was convinced mm -hmm. that this, this was the place. Mm -hmm. And every, literally every free few days I had, I came up to the Willamette Valley, driving around in the car, looking at it, you know, and, and uh, it just continued, that continued for about a year and a half. But at the same time that that was going on, this haunted me about the acid dropping out of the Pinot Noir grapes. And I started to look at the Napa Valley in historical climate data. And I saw how it was changing. And we didn't call it global warming in those days. But I saw there was no question because even when I just first got there, they were worried about frost and had a lot of frost protection. And they were worried about actually maturing their Cabernet. But over a very few years, it, it, it had changed to, there was no question things were gonna ripen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was no question there wasn't gonna be any more frost. But then it started to go the other way as to what we know now in the Napa Valley. You know. In the Napa Valley, there may not be a vineyards in 20 years from now, simply because they're running out of water, you know, and, and it's getting hotter all the time. Uh, I'm speaking from the town of Napa north, the south, they still have the fog influence, so it'll stay fairly cool there, but they don't have, have any water. And so I was thinking in the early stages of what I now realize is global warming. And so when I came to Oregon, I had a mindset about 50 years from now, what is this going to be like? I don't want to be stuck in a situation again where we have uh, grape varieties planted that are unsuitable, namely Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So I looked for an area in the Willamette Valley, and I'm anticipating a question here. Why did I locate where I did? And that is uh, because I wanted an area that dropped the temperature significantly at night to ensure the acid levels would stay decently high. And I got the wind flow charts and I saw the Van Duzer corridor and the effect of that, you know, the, the continent warming up during the day, the heat rising and the ocean cooler air fi filling in underneath. And that's the effect you get with the Van Duzer. So I started to focus on areas affected by that. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for you to ask a question okay. now. <laughs> Well, I'm going to back up one second before I ask the next question, and I'm curious, you mentioned kind of being introduced to Pinot Noir through, through Andre. What about, what about Pinot captivated you to the point that you would go to all this work to find a place to plant it? Very good question. Uh, I'm a little bit of a masochist, I think, <laughs> because Pinot Noir is hard to grow. and even more difficult to make wine out of. It is the most challenging 
I think almost all winemakers will agree, the most challenging of all the grapes. You know, it's almost like climbing Mount Everest, you know. Why climb a mountain, a small one, when you can try for the big one? Well, I'm one of those crazy people who will try to go to the big one. And so, I, I actually made Pinot Noir for about four years in Napa, Sonoma. And I, I said, I'll take on the Pinot Noir. And it got to a point where I would have a cot, and it it vi it uh, ferments with the most violent fermentation, and you have these open tanks, and it bubbles away like nothing else. But there's a point where you have to push down the cap or it gets, it gets way too hot and it kills the yeast. Well, I developed this ability to, to sleep next to it, <laughs> believe it or not. And when I heard it really going, I'd get up and get on the ladder and push it down. And, and I wasn't the only one doing that. But it was so, the specific answer is, it's the greatest challenge, I think, of all wines to make. And all the all the um, nuances that are created by uh, really your f fermentation techniques, mm -hmm. and everybody has a little different things they do, and and each vintage is a little different. You never get bored with it. You know, it Cabernet can frankly get a little boring because uh, it. You, in, in wine making, if you follow the recipe, it's going to turn out to be a good wine if you have good grapes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are many pitfalls on the way to making a Pinot Noirs, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm so proud of winemakers up here and the way they've mastered that far better at it than I ever was. So uh, the challenge was the enticement. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like, did you ever feel like you were making Pinot Noir at a level that you wanted to? Did you ever get to that point? I, you know, I came back uh, to help other people make Pinot Noir. I came to Oregon even after I'd left, and I would help. And I hope it was truly helpful <laughs> that it, it made their wine better. But that was really my contribution in that area, was helping other people. So you're looking around Oregon for, for the spot, and, you, and you've kind of zeroed in on the Van, the Van Duzer affected parts of, yeah. of, of the valley. So tell me, what you were looking for beyond that in terms of soil, in terms of elevation, in terms of, of all of those things, and, and what's the first spot that you chose? It's a good question. They, uh, I've been accused of taking some of the romance out of the industry because I like, I like the idea that there are scientific reasons why play, some places are better than others to grow grapes. And um, the soil types, as you know, we, we have really basically three soil types in, in the valley. Uh, one is caused from the original seabed floor before there were the mountains and the, the whole area was uh, uh, ocean floor. So you, you see that and then you see the volcanic, that was the second to develop the volcanic soils, uh, our famous Jory soil and, and some of the others in, in that group. 
and, and then you had the soils that were created because of the, um, the Missoula floods where that huge body of water that was created um, but because of the ice age it was all blocked off and created a big lake and and it was all over eastern Washington too and when that broke and came down the Columbia uh, created uh, Lake 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 Alice mm -hmm. the uh, back filled up to all the way to Eugene and that actually is a silt a lot of it they've shown now um, it was topsoil that came down from eastern Washington and so you have ones like the uh, Willamette silt for instance they they figured out where that came from in eastern Washington came down and and so you have these three types and they of course intermingle but generally above a certain level let's say uh, 450 feet to 500 feet you generally find the volcanic soils and then below that you get into the soils created when there was a late Lake Alice effect and uh, because of erosion and whatnot in some areas you hardly have any any uh, silt soils and then you're on the lake on the ocean bottom level and it was fairly easy for me to see that when I'd visit that you had other crops like cherries and walnuts that were up in the vol volcanic soils because they needed uh, for their root structure soils that were at least seven or eight feet deep and with good drainage and then you had what we call now hazelnuts they used to call them filberts here but hazelnuts that were farther down but they they still needed good drainage and so those were on on some of the like the Willamette mm -hmm. soil mm -hmm. And uh, then you had the, the, the seabed, which were really soil at all, but um, around Ricreal you see some of that. You can still grow grain and whatnot on them, but they don't drain very well either. I knew that grapes were like hazelnuts and cherries and walnuts, and we needed to have good drainage but also a certain amount of moisture retention because I didn't want to get into irrigating. I wanted it as natural as possible. So that, uh, that did that, and then I talked about the, the air, the desire for the influence of the ocean at night bringing in cooler air. And it really narrowed it down to the Eola Hills. They're in direct line with the Van Duzer Corridor. Uh, up to when I came, came here, most of the vineyards that were being established, and there weren't a lot, but were up in the Dundee area in, in those hills. And I'd wondered why. And I went up there and I went up to Forest Grove and there was a, one of the pioneers, Charles Corey, was up there and I got to know him real well. He was quite a character too, but I won't go into that. But uh, he, he bought there simply because there was a vineyard there. There had been a vineyard established, uh, Reuters Winery was there. It had been established, I think, in 1888. And he, and he, Ruder had put in 40 acres of grapes. He was German. Most of the varieties were German. He had a lot of varieties. Mm -hmm. But Corey bought that with the confidence that you could grow grapes that had already been shown. And so he had what I still think today is the first Pinot Gris I ever tasted in Oregon. 
There's some debate about that. It might be a German variety, but I know Dave Lepp went up there too, and we discussed Pinot Gris. Um, and interestingly enough, I'd always come through Roseburg on my way up from the Bay Area, and uh, I. I don't I always stop by Richard Summers the, down down uh, in the Roseburg area. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was the true pioneer because he came there in 1959. And he planted Pinot Noir there in 1961. So he was the first one in modern times to plant. Pinot Noir, and and he was a real believer in, in it all, and I I admire him to this day and what he did, and uh, he loved he loved nature and everything about the whole area, and we hit we hit it off really well, <laughs> but. Um, uh, he went there too because there were vineyards already in the area. And matter of fact, there were vineyards down in Ashland, Medford. I remember seeing a Tokay uh, and a Zinfandel vineyard that were planted in, in the late 1800s. And, and up in the Applegate, there was another vineyard. And there were quite a few vineyards, small vineyards scattered around the area. But I, I also discovered these were generally ancillary to, to other crops. They'd, uh, the pioneers would get maybe 150, 160 acres, and they'd plant apple trees and other things, and also grapes. It, they weren't really searching out the best place to grow the grapes. So I, I discounted where the vineyards were and again went back to saying where they should be. And so I narrowed it down to the Eola Hills and I got it down to about a 15 mile area to start off really looking. And I wanted a southeast or south or southwest exposure I had all these criteria, the drainage, the soils, and you know, the Van Duzer effect. And, um, I wanted elevated with good flow down the vineyard and the air so there we didn't have a great risk of frost. And I came up with uh, eventually Bethel Heights. And with my father I, and I, he, he got this gung-ho about this too after I really got involved. And we bought what now is known as uh, the Bethel Heights Vineyard. And at that point it was a, uh, a walnut grove uh, established in 1906. And uh, you couldn't even get directly into the property. Uh, there was an easement, but they let us go through another property. And so we had to put a road in. <laughs> and I got an old D2 Caterpillar tractor from, 19, it was built in 1938. <laughs> and I knocked down the walnut trees on the, there, there are two, parts divided by a creek. Mm -hmm. On the west side, I knocked all down those. those are the, that was the area we decided to put in first. And, uh, and I prepared the soil. And in 1976, I planted the first 20 acres. And almost all Pinot Noir, equally Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, 
but I also planted a little bit of Riesling and interestingly enough Chenin Blanc because I thought the area had enough of the similarity to the Loire Valley that there was potential there mm -hmm. too. And I was so concerned about phylloxera that I decided to put in a nursery on the property and only get cuttings from California. And my favorite Chardonnay in California was from the Wente vineyards. And I talked to them and I went to their nursery. They were running it with another family, an Italian family called Molinari. And I asked them to create the cuttings extra long so I could get a lot of root material on them. And they did, they were very nice to me. And put them in a pickup truck and took them to Oregon and that turned out to be the Wente clone, of course. And they showed me the clone in their vineyard. They singled out that clone in 1912. And that's the one that they really focused on for their good Chardonnay. I knew it was a little later ripening clone, but again, I thought over time that would, there wouldn't be a problem in the Willamette Valley uh, ripening it. So I used, used that and, uh, and they also worked with some other vineyards and got me the Pinot Noir and the other cuttings. And off we went and and uh, I actually rooted some of the vines right in the vineyard. And that, that vineyard site is predominantly jory. Mm -hmm. And it goes into some Nikaya towards the bottom. But it was a great spot and I think it's proven itself out to be a good one. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then being doing this without significant money uh, you'll f find from the documents I supplied that I tried to get other people to invest with me in a winery there and I just couldn't convince people that the industry was viable in Oregon and so I was forced to sell just a few years later. And, but that's how I found my first location in, in Oregon. So after, after all the research and the preparation that you had done, were there unforeseen challenges to, to starting a vineyard? Was there something, were there things you weren't prepared for that you had to deal with? That's a good question. I've never quite looked at it that way. And it, it, it is kind of amazing that it actually went according to plan. <laughs> when I look back at it now, that is a very good question. But it did, it, it actually, you know, the plants grew. Andre Chelischeff came up there and looked at the site a number of times and and the first time he saw it he said he looked at me like I was kind of dumb when I asked him well do you think this is a good site and he looked at me I said what he said well you see they started to plant some cherry trees off one side and they were really the cherries were abundant and he see see those cherries over there I said yeah he said what are those I said they're royal ants why he said those are French cherries Okay, he said, see those walnut trees over there on the other side that were still? I said, yeah, they're English walnuts. He said, they're not English, those are franquettes. They call them English walnuts, but they're growing in France. He said, I look around here and this could be in the middle of France. He said, why are you asking me this question? He said, you put a Pinot Noir and a Chardonnay stick, he called it, sticks in the ground right here. 
and as long as you give them a little water, in three years you'll have grapes. He said, this is a, a natural setting for these. He said, you don't have to do anything artificial here to have very good grapes. And he was right. And, and not only was he right, but because the natural setting was so great, there weren't a lot of surprises. Mm. It, it did what nature intended. Mm. And uh, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd shudder to think if I had to put in all kinds of irrigation and everything and, you know, and it doesn't work right or something. There are a lot of variables that I didn't have because of the, the great natural setting. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think now of the old Amity Hills not having vineyards in it, but obviously this is the first or among the first vineyards among to go into first. the area. Yeah. Tell me about the reaction of the people around you, of, the, of, your, <laughs> of your neighbor neighboring landowners. What, what did they think of your venture? I have to laugh about it because when I was out there and I didn't have my planting machine then, this was by hand. My dad made planting these. And suddenly I'm down here, you know, putting the soil around the plant. And I see these big shoes next to me. And I look up, and it's one of the local farmers. And he said, don't you know you can't grow those things here? <laughs> and I laughed. And I said, why, have you tried? And he said, well, no. And, and then he kind of just turned around, walked away, and that was, that was it, you know, welcome. <laughs> but the funny thing was, less than 10 years later, I put a vineyard on his property. He sold his property to a friend of mine, and today it's called Zena. <laughs> I don't know if it's still called Zena, but it was originally O'Connor Vineyard, big vineyard. And consequently, instead of selling, as he was getting older, and sell, instead of selling his ground for grain at $1,000 an acre, he sold his property for $4,000 an acre. And I reminded him, weren't you the one who said you couldn't? <laughs> and he laughed. He said, it, it pays to be wrong sometimes, Vic. And that was so great. But yeah, there was, there was that. Obviously, there would be, because you, you, you had over 100 years of growing certain crops, and you've got a new crop coming in. And uh, it it was kind of humorous at times to see the reactions, but I guess that's all gone away now, you know. But but there was doubt for many years, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, I I'm giving you uh, documents on our newspapers when they you still can hear the ring a little bit of doubt about growing grapes in the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. So before we get to the other vineyards that you, you worked on, I'm curious, uh, you, you have your first one near Bethel Heights, it, it's going along according to plan, but you can't get anyone to invest in it, so you have to sell it. So I'm curious about that process, because we now know what Bethel Heights is now. So tell me about the process of finding people to, to buy that property. That wasn't easy. And I put an ad in the industry magazine, Wines and Vines, a vineyard for sale in Willamette Valley. And I, I got a, a few bites. But then, um, and people looked at it. But then the uh, Dudley Castile family came down and looked at it. And I like them. They're, they're my age, and they're all kind of semi hippies, so I I could relate, you know. And 
and they were from Seattle and I was a little concerned because they had no experience and, but uh, we talked and I showed them the property and Pat's father came out from New York City and he was last name Dudley and he came out and he, he asked me, so Vic, you really think this is an optimum place to grow grapes? And I said, yeah. And you worked in the Napa Valley, yeah. And I gave him the background. So they, they made an offer on the place and, and the thing that really sold me was that, and well, obviously I needed the money, but they wanted me to stay on for a while and show them how to do things. And even like operating the tractor, you know, fundamental things. But, and, and that's what happened, you know, we, worked together out there and I saw they were hard workers and they were committed and to this day one of the things I'm most grateful for in my life is that they bought the property because I can't imagine better people buying that because here you had uh, Ted who took over the assignment of the vineyards and to this day he's still doing it and he's done a masterful job and uh, his brother Terry immersed himself in how to make wine and became a truly great winemaker. And you had Pat Dudley. Pat, I always have to smile because we laugh so much when we get together because she's such a force. And she was not only committed to the winery, she was committed, she became committed to the industry here. You know, I don't know what committees she hasn't been on you know, but talk about a force. And, and Maryland was out there trying to convince, you know, bashes to take on the wine and things like that. The, all four of them were really, really in earnest trying to make a go of it and showed true passion for this. And to this day, they still do. And now, of course, Ben has taken over as winemaker and he had to do it in an unfortunate circumstance uh, because his father got Parkinson's disease but he seized it uh, in his own quiet way he just he got in there and did everything you needed to do and did it in such an incredible way that those wines today, I think, are the best they've ever been. Yeah. And I have, I have a library of Bethel Heights wines going all the way back to the first ones. And, and both the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir to me, I'm biased, but I've had blind tastings and those wines consistently are a, you know, right at the top. And, and the Chardonnay, too. I'm so proud of that Chardonnay that Ben does. Mm -hmm. And then Ben's cousin, Mimi. Mimi is kind of the conscience of the whole operation in that she's so attuned to what's good for nature and, you know, the, the, the minimal use of herbicides and all that in which I, I appreciate very much. So it's a, it's a nice balance there. And that whole family, I couldn't have wished 
a better family to take over. Mm -hmm. so, there it is again, you know, better lucky than anything else. <laughs> No. Well, and and not and I guess they're 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 your family now too. I believe there is there is yeah. a connection there. Tell tell us a bit more about that. Well, my my daughter. Well, this is like one of those TV movies that are hard to believe. <laughs> but my daughter married Ben. So. And no, we don't have our own little mafia or anything. This is just the way what happened, you know. But <laughs> but my daughter has. A, passion for it too and and uh, she's working at Flanor up at Carlton and she just loves it she loves the everything about wine promotion and one thing frankly I got tired of I was a pioneer I was kind of the Johnny Appleseed of guy of the industry. I wasn't really big on all the formal wine tastings and that. That wasn't, I, I did it, I bought it building down on Edgewater in Salem and we had formal wine tastings because I thought it was necessary but Ben and, and my daughter, they can they eat and breathe this 24 hours a day, and they they love it so much. Thank God, you know. So yeah, and, and now I look at uh, Marty, the owner of Flanor. He he's showing that passion too. He bought the big grain elevator in McMinnville and created this beautiful tasting room and all this and. It's making great wines, and you know it. It it's just so heartwarming to see it all. Mm -hmm. Myron Redford up at Amity, and he and I got to be friends, and we took French together, so we could read these French textbooks and wine books, and, and he was better at it than I was, though. But we had fun learning. We got a our own private French teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was worried about her with my pronunciation, but <laughs> now I can speak better. I go to France. And I'm not as inhibited as mm -hmm. in those days. So. so tell me about the next step then after, after Bethel Heights. Obviously there's more vineyards to come. So what's the next step for you uh, then at that point? Well, I, I wanted to stay in the industry and I knew from my studies in the past that were, there were many potential sites in the area. And I also thought in order for this industry to really blossom, it needed considerably more grapes and production of wine. It couldn't be just a cottage industry. So um, I got together with a fellow named Ron Seeley, whose family goes back generations in the valley as farmers. And I've, we figured it this way, that the farmers probably wouldn't understand me, but they would understand him and, and give him credibility. So the two of us, I explained to Ron what I looked for and knew this, and he was great because he knew how to approach the people. He knew a lot of them. And he'd go up to their, I said, I'd say that is really a good sign. He'd go up to their door. He wouldn't ask them if their property was for sale for at least half an hour. We called it clod kicking. They'd talk about everything except that. And so Winquist and Seely was born for to be exclusively in locating potential vineyard properties. And 
I became a broker of those properties, but also a developer of those properties. And had my real estate license, everything was legal. And I put an ad into the Wines and Vines magazine, a display ad for us, and it worked. And uh, slowly uh, uh, people started coming in and one of the first ones I did was Witness Tree. And that one, just around the corner in the Yellow Hills from, from uh, Bethel Heights, and a beautiful southeast slope. And I remember looking at it, and there was one horse out in the field, on the lower field there, in this kind of dilapidated house. And Ron went up to the house, and he talked with him. And I, then I came up. And finally, we asked him, do you think you might, might want to sell this property? And he looked at me and he said, Vic, everything I've got's for, got is for sale, including my wife. <laughs> and that, that was it. That place uh, was sold to an airline pilot for what was then PSA. His name was Doug Jemsko. And we still talk. He, he, he sold the property. A few of the properties that I developed have sold, a lot are still in original hands. Mm -hmm. But that was the first one. And, and then, uh, and I named it Witness Tree because there's a big oak tree up a uh, fairly high level on the property. And it's the quarter section mark for the uh, Walker donation land claim of 1854. It's emblazoned right on it. So, and that was on the original label for Witness Tree. And uh, then I, I handled uh, what became known as Temperance Hill above Bethel Heights. And I named it Temperance Hill because I liked the name in relation to Bethel Heights and kind of the religious overtones of that area. And there's a church down below called Bethel and all that. And that year there was a horse running that won the Kentucky Derby named Temperance Hill and I stole the name from it. <laughs> but it was just perfect for it. And that family was fascinating because I got a call about one of the really good property. And the family were from Hong Kong and Malaysia. And the day they showed up, it was one of those miserable days in the winter. And just raining and raining and raining. So we went up there, came to the edge of Temperance Hill. And I'll never forget, it was father and son. and. The father, he wouldn't get out of the car. He lowered the window a little bit and looked at it. And the son said, my father wants to know if this is really a good property. I said, yes, it is. And we went back to the office and they bought it. <laughs> and, and then we planted uh, a little over 100 acres there with our machine that time. And and then uh, uh, we went down below uh, Bethel Heights and uh, another fellow named O'Connor, who didn't drink, bought that property from the farmer I was talking mm -hmm. about who mm -hmm. said, you can't, don't you know, you can't grow those things here. And he put in quite a substantial we put in a, quite a substantial vineyard for him. And then we went around to, uh, I won't name them all, but we went around to, I think it's still called Firesteed, I'm not sure, 
but it, it was Flynn at that point on Highway 99. Planted, that was the first one actually that we planted with our planting machine. And uh, went up, Seven Springs was another one that we did. Um, uh, uh, all, I think all told there were 16, about, uh, about 740 acres. We were pretty busy there. <laughs> Just a few kind of well-known vineyards that are still fairly, fairly popular. Yeah, unfortunately all 16 turned out very well. Incredible. You, you mentioned the planting machine. Tell, tell me about the planting machine. Well, I was up visiting Dick Erath one day and he was expanding the vineyard and we went out to the vineyard and I looked at some of the vines and by accident I actually pulled one up because the workers were being paid by the number of plants they put in the ground. And what they were doing wasn't really digging the plants in, they were kind of just piling dirt as much so they could really move. Well, I didn't, didn't want that. And I didn't want to have to go out and put cartons around and put water in. So there's got to be a way of mechanically planting these. And so I designed this triangular piece of structure of uh, uh, four by four box steel in a triangle on, and on the back uh, side that was um, 12 feet wide I, ha I designed uh, uh, steel flanges that came out pushed the earth out and you could have people one people sitting on each side of it and they could drop a vine in and then I found the ideal way to move the earth back in that was 1952 Nash Rambler wheels they were perfect size and he angled them in a little bit left this much room between them for the vines but it shoved the dirt back in and then I had some compression wheels too so the earth would be pushed down and we were able to plant two rows at a time at about two miles an hour or so and it and we could plant it came out to a grapevine every five seconds yeah yeah of course hadn't this is when you're young you know didn't never tested it. We just took it out to Firestein, put it on the first row. We had it all marked out. Put it on the first row and and there was hash marks and on, on the other way too so they knew when to put them in. And we just took off. It worked. It was amazing. Looking back on it now, I just cringe at the thought of what could have gone wrong. But of course, you know, we couldn't plant when it was really muddy and stuff. But, but it, it, it worked out. And the one, one funny story is when we planted Witness Tree, uh, the owner ha had to fly that day, so he had to take off early in the morning. And it was 20 acres. And he said, oh, I'll look really forward to coming back and seeing the planting going on when I get back. Well, by the time he got back that day, it had all been planted. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> and so that's, the, and it was on hydraulics. So we could go down the highway. Mm -hmm. It had two big wheels. And we could, you know, lift it up and tow it behind a truck. And we had to have flags and everything, it's pretty wide, but oh yeah, we went all over with that thing. And, and then we could lower it just to the depth we wanted. 
and which was pretty deep mm -hmm. because we wanted those to have a great root structure on them. Mm -hmm. So we had this much below and just this much above the ground, you know. And so we didn't have to water them. They just, you know, they were great. So that's the story behind the, the planting machine. And, and it did all the planting and, that I did up here, from, except for Bethel Heights, mm -hmm. which was planted by hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was uh, another fascinating thing that happened. And thank God it worked. <laughs> So. so all told, once you guys started into that, into that business with, with Ron Seeley, how long of a stretch was that and, and what, 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 why did you leave the industry? That was three years. And then typical of all agriculture, um, the industry had not developed the wine production capacity enough. So we started, believe it or not, to get an oversupply of grapes for a very short period of time, it turned out. And, and the overall national economy wasn't doing well. And so as fast as people got interested in putting in vineyards, there came a time where nobody was interested again hmm. for a, f a few years. And... Uh, so I uh, had to cease operations and uh, then I, I went to work for, uh, eventually for Union Bank of Switzerland and we handled all kinds of things in, including agricultural land and vineyard lands and I specialized in that. That's where I finally made some money in the wine industry, <laughs> was as an investment banker, you know. And uh, once in a while, I would go out to California uh, and make wine with my, one of my old friends, or they'd have me make a wine for them out there. And so I kept my toe in it, and, and uh, I was a wine consultant in that role for a number of years. And the last wine I made in California, uh, turned out great. It was a petite Syrah. They really needed to get some recommendation or positive points in mm -hmm. a Wine Spectator, that magazine. And so I felt like I was kind of a hit man. I went in there and it was petite Syrah and I doubled up the skins on the fermentation. I took half of it, made a white wine out of it and I grabbed those skins, put them in the fermenter, and we turned out this big Petit Syrah, real inky, and it got a great score. And I gave it to my daughter to try out, and she looked at me. My daughter, unfortunately, has always told me the unvarnished truth. And she said, Dad, this is quite possibly the worst wine you've ever made. <laughs> and I said, well, why is that? And she said, because all you can taste is this. You couldn't have it with any food. And she didn't know at the time her, her, her teeth had turned this kind of rosé color from the color. And, and I didn't laugh, though, but I said, and I knew what she meant. It was a, a distortion, grotesque in a way. But that was the era of, of big, bold wines. And so that's when I quit making wine. <laughs> I decided it, I, 
I was almost prostituting myself doing that. Hold on for just one second while we... Yeah. Get the... Well, maybe he's done. So, I'm curious as you look back on, we'll talk about the vineyard part of things in Oregon, of course, kind of what you're, what you're most well known for here. Uh, the, the, the vineyards you mentioned are all legendary vineyards still to this day. What does it mean to you to have seen that kind of happen to those, those vineyards and the, the, the reputation they have to this day? It, it means to me a number of things. One, thank God I was lucky and I was right, you know. I look at it sometimes, there's got to be a wine god in the sky that helps you out sometimes. Because I was young, and granted, I did all the research I could do and planted where, what I thought they should be. But I could have been wrong, too. So thank God the wine god in the sky helped me out on that one. The other thing is, it took great people, the owners, to see it through. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm really grateful to. You look at those properties and what those owners did to follow through with these great sites. And to one they have. I mean, how fortunate is that? You know, that is really something. And the few that have sold have sold to good people who've done even more with the sites. There was a time uh, right when I was shutting down Winquist and Seeley that I felt like I could be tarred and feathered here because the, the market was down. We were going through an unusually cold period in the valley. It was hard to mature the grapes. Wente was questionable. What, what time span are we talking about here? We're, we're talking in 1984, 85, 86. And it was not a happy time here. And, you know, I'm sure I was cursed more than a few times. But again, I was looking at what we call global warming, and I thought, you know, it's, it's all coming about mm -hmm. sooner or later. But uh, the combination of the great sites, which I was lucky to pick out, and the great people that it brought in, I very, feel very fortunate about. And what they've done for the valley, as well as many other people who put in vineyards and wineries, is incredible. And that's a legacy that I feel so good about. And it's, uh, I'm even, you know, I'm up here looking for a potential property now. So I'm, I was talking with my daughter last night and she, said, well, the one thing I would like, maybe, I like that, is a small Chardonnay vineyard. And uh, I'm looking around McBenville for a home. So it's, it's nice to return when, when you see such a, a wonderful environment that's been created. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Obviously, you have a very interesting and unique perspective on the growth of the industry. So, so tell me about that from kind of the, the humble beginnings in the Ole Hills to, to now. What, are, what have you seen in the Oregon wine industry? What are, what are the big uh, kind of milestones and changes that have, that have occurred? Well, of course, that's a, that's a big topic. Just, <laughs> in, just in hard numbers, when I first got here, I think they were lucky to have a million dollars in revenue off grapes. And though some of that was Concord, you know, up in Milwaukee, there was a big Concord winery. Um, now, I think it's around $245 million. So, 
that in itself is something. And then, as I mentioned before, somehow they come up with a statistic that 40,000 jobs have been created. It's another wonderful thing. Um, I, you know, and it's, it of course goes well beyond the economics. It creates a lifestyle, it creates an overall richness of culture, if you will, like we're experiencing even in Portland, but down, you know, you go down 99 and you see it, um, a little too much traffic now, but that's the consequence of it. Um, I hope it stays in balance, though. I, I'm sounding like the old geezer I am now, but when I first went to the Napa Valley, you know, I worked with Italian families, French families, German families, like Beringer, and and they had sm relatively small businesses, but beyond that. It was very personal. And now you go there, and of course they got the train, and it's just jam packed, and the tasting rooms just have hundreds of people going through it. I hope we don't get to this, this stage where we're another kind of semi Disneyland. Hmm. You know, that's sounding like a 74 year old geezer, but that, that's my perspective on it. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer a question that you may or may not ask, and that is the future of the Willamette Valley wine industry in the face of global warming. And I feel I, I witnessed it early on we didn't, as I said, we didn't call it that, but I've seen the Willamette Valley change so much in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to repeat, it's in danger of going out of existence. Uh, I just, I read a couple of weeks ago that one vineyard is contracting uh, with the, the town of Napa uh, for reclaimed water that they're trucking to their vineyard. Well, that makes no economic sense. You might get the water cheap, but the trucking costs, costs you a fortune. I know that. And you just can't, you can't sustain that. And of course, we're seeing forest fires and all, all that. I don't have to go into all that. And we're seeing smoke taint in the grapes. It was terrible in 2017 in the, in the Napa Valley. And, of course, we had it here in the Willamette Valley. I don't like the taste of smoking cigarettes when I'm drinking Pinot Noir. <laughs> that just does not work for me. I can see it in brandy, you know, distill it. But, but I don't want us to underestimate what can happen. And it was brought home to me last year I went back to Bainbridge Island and Puget Sound. And here again, the great wine god intervened because what did I see? I saw a Pinot Noir vineyard on Bainbridge Island, right next to my Baco Noir. Here's Pinot Noir growing and they're maturing it. I would have never dreamed that possible 30 years ago. Well, it wasn't possible then, but that's how much it's changing. And I've been asked, you know, what would you plant? If, if you come back here, what are you going to plant? And that is a great question. Because now I think you can grow so many different varieties to full maturity, including Cabernet, and including Petit Syrah, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, you know. I have some Sangiovese down in my home, and in Bisbee, and I keep thinking I should make cuttings in this, get ready for Oregon. But, but uh, all kidding aside, it's, it's a very serious issue, and uh, that's why I prize the Van Duzer corridor effect, because that may save us 
from the consequence that we saw in the Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. What have you seen specifically when it comes to vineyard sort of finding vineyard sites and, and developing them. How has that changed in, in the time you've been watching? I, I'm going to catch grief on this one, but um, as happens in all grape growing areas, as the choice sites are locked up, if you will, and it might not necessarily be they all go into vineyards, but they're under other crops that aren't you're not going to get them out of there. People get more desperate to find sites and they go to more marginal sites. For instance, uh, I ruled out going to the east side of the valley up against the Cascades up in that mm -hmm. area early on because of the weather patterns, because they're much more pr prone to hail and uh, uh, much higher precipitation levels in, in those areas. And I ruled out growing grapes on, I'm not picking on Ricreol, but this is the name of the soil in that area. It's just too shallow and it's too wet. But I'm starting to see some vines in those areas. Well, now the consequence for it is it's too wet in the winter, but it's also too dry in the summer. The, the roots cannot penetrate in it very far at all. So there's subject to uh, the vagaries of weather, uh, uh, wet and dry. Uh, that that concerns me that we're getting to that that point. Um, the other thing is, you know, uh, uh, phylloxera. We probably had it since the 1880s because a, a lot of plants were brought in, scattered all, mm -hmm. all over. Well, very unlikely they didn't have phylloxera. It's, it's spreading very so, slowly in our soil types, but it's there. And unfortunately, my planting machine, you know, s spread it like everybody else did because I got from nurseries the rooted stocks and none of us knew that it had phylloxera, but it's, it's here. I just hope we ended up with the right root stocks to match mm -hmm. to it. And um, the future may see us, you know, this is sacrilegious, I know, but may see us with many different varieties of grapes. Yeah, and uh, I wouldn't rule out some of the best Italian varieties, the best Spanish varieties, as well as Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. Well, the one last question I have for you, because we talked about it a bit off camera before we started, the development of wine country itself and, and the, the, the towns around here. Tell me, tell me about the changes you've seen to places like McMinnville uh, since, since you've been around and, and uh, kind of what they look like now compared to your first impressions. Well, Ed, I'm a foodie. I love I loved to cook. And my wife just stands back when I get in the kitchen and I cook all the meals. And I love fresh produce. And one of the reasons I moved back here, besides, you know, obviously the family and grandchildren, is this is a paradise when it comes to produce. And I'm envious. Ben is a gourmet chef. You know, we compare notes all the time, but I, in Arizona, I can't match what you have here. Uh, this has lended itself to creating great farm-to-table restaurants. 
When I was here starting out, and McMinnville was a farm town, there was hardly a place to eat. You know, Amity, good luck, you know. And, and Salem, sorry Amity, you're great now, you know. But in and, and Salem, it wasn't that red hot, you know. You could go get a prime rib if you wanted that, and that type of food. And it was such a shame because of what I saw in the produce. And you combine these beautiful, sophisticated wines now with the wonderful food. And it's almost like going to heaven without dying. I mean, this is, this is a great place to live, and it's, of course, attracting a lot more people. But it's all because of the wine industry. It, as it just blossomed with its greatness, it brought along things like great restaurants. And, of course, many other things, too. And, and I'm just, I look forward, you know, like, uh, well, tonight Ben's cooking, but we're going to be going out with their friends to different restaurants, and they're all into the, the food. And I tell them, you're so spoiled. You've got all these wonderful ingredients here. You know, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and not only have the wine gods done wonderful things for the Oregon wine industry, but as a side effect, there are these other things like the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here that we should have covered? No, I think, you know, I can go on for hours, but I'll bore people stupid. So this is perfect. Thank you very much. We don't want you to fall out of your chair or anything like that. Oh. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking sure. the time, sharing your stories with us, and uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you.